أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته dear brothers and sisters uh, you had a long discussion on um, revival of Islam on uh, in the uh, Balkans now you had a, a nice dinner so this is the day of Akika of uh, Yahya Islam son of uh, Aminul Islam we make dua for his uh, good health and his good future he become a good Muslim also and we pray uh, for our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and everybody our parents those who have passed away and uh, those who are sick among us for them and uh, in this Qiyamul Layl uh, it's a, a night of Baraka a night of Friday night Juma's night so inshallah our Allah will uh, grant our dua and uh, uh, all the Baraka and the blessings of Allah will be with us in this topic, you can see there is two parts of it. One part is spiritual journey and the another part is an Australian Muslim. So spiritual journey, like it's linked to your faith, what you believe. And our belief is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So it has, that faith has got two parts. One part is submission to Allah, recognizing Allah as our creator and sustainer and nourisher and our Lord. And we are his servant and we recognize our prophet as our leader whom we have to follow. So if we keep this mind in our life journey, that becomes our spiritual journey. That means we never could forget it. We should never forget it that who we are what shahada we have made, what witness we have made, and that journey, everything in your life, in our life, would be the spiritual journey. Because if I go to work, I do the job honestly as a servant of Allah and a follower of uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's my spiritual journey also. Because Allah asked us to earn our rizq, Allah given, gives us rizq, rizq comes from Allah. So if all these beliefs stays with us, it's our spiritual journey. And now, Australian Muslim. This is something that uh, we have to understand why we are saying Australian Muslim, we are not saying on, only Muslim. Now, to become Australian Muslim, a lot of us here, we made a journey through our life. And the journey starts... Uh, from our childhood, how we grow up, how we uh, expose to our deen, our interaction with our brothers and sisters, interaction of, with our society, and all these things we did done. So, this, an Australian Muslim, the story of Australian Muslim, it's my story, your story, and many of us, our story, how we become Australian Muslim. So today, I'll share with you that how I become an Australian Muslim. Just, just a bit of uh, uh, thing that I have passed through and possibly Allah blessed that on me. So, uh, and you, you may have uh, similar kind of sh stories in your life and which in future maybe if you come forward and want to tell us, we listen from you too. So, as I said, the journey started from childhood. As I can remember far, and the first thing I remember was at the age of 12, I started working for a group, those who were doing dawa. And they, they were, uh, there was from my school and guided by some of the senior uh, students from the universities. They were coming to us and guiding us and we were making dawa. So we are looking at who are the boys praying in the masjid, coming to the masjid, and we are inviting them to come to the masjid to have uh, uh, salah. And we were inviting them to do some tarbiyah to become good Muslims. So that's the way it started. Then I became a medical student, became a doctor, uh, and then I, and, and we did a lot of, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, 
charity work because where I born, Bangladesh, it was a country of calamities, cyclones, what's happening in Fiji, it was happening every year in our country. So a lot of us as a young, we used to go out for do relief works, help the people. And by that exposure, our mind was changed. Our minds was changed like this, that say, oh, there is so much suffering for the human being, the creation of Allah, what we are doing. And then these things continued in our life. So when we become doctor, some of our elders, and one person I must mention, it is the ambassador of Saudi Arabia, Fuad Abdul Hamid Al Khatib, he called us one day. He said there is an organization called Rabita. This is a Saudi government funded organization. And I want you to go to the Rohingya refugees to help them because you are a doctor. They need you there. And that's the first point he made. And then he said, look, you have to go for another reason because all the Christians, missionaries there before you, they went there and they are spreading their deen, helping them and converting the people to uh, Christianity. So this is your responsibility, another responsibility to prevent that happening. We said, oh, okay, inshallah, we go. So we went there and then we started working. So initially, the non-Muslims were not cut, coming near to us. So one day, uh, our cook, he went to the market and he came back and saying that uh, some people, they're Hindus, they want to come and see us as a patient, as a doctor. Can they come? I said, of course. Why they should, should not be coming? They should be coming because they are the creation of Allah and we will not discriminate them if they are patient. We will not discriminate among our patients whether they are Muslim or they are not Muslim. They are Hindus or something like that. So next day the cook went and gave them the message and they came in good numbers. The Hindu patients. We were only serving the Muslim patients before. So we served them. We looked after them and gradually, even some of the uh, people, though poor people, those who became Christian, they also started coming. And then after that, uh, we had a small masjid inside the hospital. So uh, they started coming to our imam, saying some of those, those who had converted to Christianity, they said, we are sorry, we like to come back to Islam. So uh, we said, okay, imam, uh, Imam said that the job was done by the doctors, but I am getting the benefit, I am giving you shahada. So they become Muslim. And a lot of the Hindus during that time, uh, they, were, they were the lower class. You know, in Hindus, they are upper class and lower class. They are lower class. They used to call them water servant, uh, the upper class people. So they are uh, outcast people. But when they came, we put them same as our patients, nice bed and checking them, giving them good medicine. So they realized that in Islam there is no discrimination. So they also become Muslim. So a chapter of the, my journey, looking at it, said it's changed my mind. That saying what we are, we are Muslim. And actually we should be for everybody. Like I'm a doctor, I should be for everybody and do good things for everybody. And then this is the way it happened. Uh, and one day, uh, the ambassador called us for a meeting. He came, actually. Uh, it was uh, in border of Bangladesh and Burma. And uh, those who know the area, is Cox's Bazar and a faraway district in Bangladesh. And he came. He came with a flight and meet with us and say that, boys, you have done a very good job. But I want to replace you by some other new doctors. Then we said, why? So, so he said, because I want to send you to Somalia. I said, oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, so then uh, he said to us that, look, uh, I'm sending you to Somalia for two reasons. One is they don't have uh, enough doctors there. Uh, we need to help them, our refugee brothers from Ugadan, the part of um, the southern part of Somalia. So Somali people call it Ogadan, and the Ethiopian call it as East uh, Ethiopia. So there was conflict that time. And then uh, uh, the refugees, vast number of refugees came to Somalia, and they need help. So 
the ambassador wants us to send there. So he gives us two briefings again. One is they need your help as a doctor, and there is a lot of Christians before you already gone there, and they are trying to convert, but Somali people are very strong, and I haven't heard anything that any Somali is converted to uh, Christianity. Mashallah, they were, their iman was so strong. But anyhow, we went, went there. Uh, on the way, our boss, we met the boss, Rabita's boss, was uh, um, Sheikh uh, Abdullah bin Baz. He was the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia at that time. So we met him. So he gave us the same lecture, the same hedaya, saying that, look, you're going to help the people, and uh, you help the people as much as you can, and then uh, you help the uh, people to strong their iman, and uh, we are sending some mubalegs with you, teachers with you, who will teach uh, Quran and Hadith to the refugee people, and you work together, and that is your mission. And alhamdulillah, we went there, and when we went there, we also find the, mostly the Italian doctors and nurses and a lot of other people there. So um, we said, what do we do with them? We work, started our work, doing our work, and some stage we have um, mixed work with them. So we said, okay, they are helping the people, we are helping the people, so there is no discrimination, we work together. So that work, together, a lot of the Italian doctors and nurses become Muslim. So how did that happen? I sometimes think, how did that happen? Happen? Uh, then I realized that we were given a briefing from our bosses and our elders saying that you don't discriminate, you help everybody. So we are open to all. We were kind to all, and that helped us to uh, make it possible that some Italian doctors, uh, there was a doctor, his name was Angelo, so he came to uh, me one day that I want to be a Muslim. I said, why you want to be a Muslim? Because I, I didn't ask you to be a Muslim, but that's not for uh, you, you, because I worked uh, with you for a long time, I realized uh, my uh, understanding, I was looking for a truth. And finally I got the truth that Islam is the ultimate truth, so I want to be a Muslim. I said, if that's the conception, that's fine. So uh, we established Masjid inside the camp, and we took him to the Sheikh, and Sheikh made the Shahada for him, and we made Dua. And after him, a lot of other friends of him followed to become a Muslim, nurses become Muslim. and. The Italian government felt very offended about it, and they closed up all their camps and asked them to go back home. But anyhow, our mission was successful. That uh, what the, uh, Abdullah bin Baz, when he heard about all these things, he said, "Boys, you have done a very wonderful job." So then, uh, Saudi government allows us to work in Saudi Arabia. So nine years I worked there in the hospitals. Uh, that's another part of the journey. So, like, I did my job as a doctor, but it was always in my mind, I'm a Muslim. Whatever I do, I do uh, fairly, equally, and without any discrimination between my patients. In Saudi Arabia, there's work forces. There was um, Saudis there who are Muslim. There is Muslim uh, expatriates, those who went to work there. And even in them, some of them are Hindus. Some of them are um, Christians and all these people. And we just give them the service as we could. And like we, we work together with the um, people coming from Philippines, people coming from uh, India, those who are Hindus and Christians. So they're coming into our contact and gradually they want to learn about Islam. And again, a group of nurses, doctors, and uh, uh, technicians become Muslim. So always when uh, I used to go to these ulemas, like uh, sheikhs, they used to say, how it is possible people work with you and they become Muslim? Do you know what, what's going on? Uh, because uh, Abdullah bin Bas said that I am a sheikh, I am the Grand Mufti, I didn't convert anyone in Islam. 
but you doctors did so much. How you can do it? I said, Sheikh, I, we don't know. We just do our job and they get attracted to us, ask questions, we <coughs> answer the questions, and they make decision to become Muslim. So that's the journey I was telling you that how it happens. Then come the becoming Australian Muslim. At, after nine years, I was thinking that uh, I should go back to my country to serve my own nation. So that was my decision. Everything was ready. Uh, Sheikh bin Baz told me, Ya Walid, La Erja min Bangladesh. Don't go back to Bangladesh. I said, Lesh, why? Why I should not go my country? So he said, there is something Allah given to you and your other friends that is different from us. That we are good for a Muslim country, but you are good for something else. I said, what is that? You are good for a non-Muslim country. So tell, he told me that you make Nia so that you go to a non-Muslim country and serve for Allah and for the intention of Allah. So I said, if that's the uh, hadayat you give me, I'll, I'll follow it. Then beside that, there's another person called Ahmed Tutunji. He was the president of the WAMI, the uh, uh, World Muslim Youth Organization. So he was one of our elders, and he said, no, you should not go back to Bangladesh. You should go to any non-Muslim country you want. And uh, possibly some, he, he, he's the one who suggested you should go to Australia because a lot of your friends went to Europe, uh, America, and they are doing good job there, but you should go to um, Australia because we haven't had much people gone to Australia to for these purposes. And uh, like it's mo more than 20 years ago, so definitely our Muslims were not coming too much in this country except maybe Fiji was close country, they were coming here. But we were other, other people where we were not coming there, okay? Anyhow, and uh, then another person, you know, you heard the name of uh, the great Dai uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat from South Africa. He used to visit uh, uh, Saudi Arabia a few times. And he met us and met our programs where we were uh, doing the programs with the rewards, and he said, look, uh, you should not go back to Bangladesh, you should go to a non-Muslim country and preach Islam. Because for some reason, I, I don't know, uh, even I don't know yet that some people attract, um, because you're not a sheikh, you don't uh, preach uh, Quran or Hadith too much, but still people want to listen to you, and which doesn't happen to us quite often. But uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didad, just, you know, he uh, faced so many things in his life. He dedicated his for dawah. So when all these people were saying this, I couldn't say no. And then a lot of things happened automatically. Uh, one of my fr uh, friend, he worked out to me to come to Australia. And when I came to Australia as a doctor, nobody believed that I came to a, uh, Australia uh, as a doctor and a, with a job and because for a doctor to have a job coming from overseas was an impossible thing that time but that was happened so then I gradually become Australian and then I become Australian Muslim so you understand that's my spiritual journey take me to become uh, the Australian Muslim so that's why I thought that I talk about the spiritual journey of an Australian Muslim. So that's the context. And you, a lot of, of you have the, maybe the similar story. Your journey towards your life guides you through. And sometimes Allah makes the decision for you, not you. Because I built a house in Bangladesh and to go back there and to stay with my parents and everything. And everything was gone, in, like, a, like a winds, gone with winds, you know. So I couldn't go back to Bangladesh. I, I visit Bangladesh, but I couldn't go back to Bangladesh. Everything was changed. Like, if I, if I say honestly, before 25 years ago, I never thought that I'll come to Australia. My dream was I'll, earn, I, I'll go back to my country and I'll serve my people. So that's the way the whole thing started. So now let's look at other concepts that I want to share with you. 
Now I consider and also I think you will consider this that this is a blessing for us from Allah that we are Australian and we are Muslim. Both of this identity. Now what we are living with, I don't consider myself a Bangladeshi now because I mixed up with all the Australian people, my everything is here, my earning, my thinking, my uh, whatever I do, it's all based on Australia. So that's why I said I'm Australian Muslim. I don't longer, I, I don't any time say that I'm a Bangladeshi Muslim. No, never I did. When I was in Bangladesh, I was a, only a, a Muslim. I was not a Bangladeshi Muslim. But here in Australia, I became Australian first, and I also I was Muslim already. So I had to become Australian, and that is a question of integrity. So like quite often we face the question from the government or the people or the people who doesn't like us that the Muslims, we don't integrate. So I said that, look, we integrate more than you integrate to Australia. They said, how? I said, you born and you don't have a choice other than becoming Australian. Because before coming here, I was Bangladeshi and I didn't have a choice other than Bangladesh, being a Bangladeshi. But I choose to become Australian. So I am more Australian than you. I am Australian by choice. So I integrated more. Now, where is the integration stance? Okay, integration stance there that I love my country and uh, I love my uh, um, nation. I love my, I, I, I'm ready to sacrifice everything for my country. So if we are commonly thinking that, integration is there. Now, I read eat, eat rice, I read curry, I read something. So that doesn't need to be integrated. And if you offer me to drink alcohol with you and pork with you, possibly that doesn't need to be integrated. That can stay separate. You eat, you eat your food, I eat my food. Because this is just the way uh, some part of it is what I like or some part of it is what my faith allows me to do. So what is your faith allows you to do, and uh, you do, and I do. But when the interest of the country comes, I love Australia as, as much as you do. And I'll sacrifice for Australia myself, my anything, my wealth, my life, or anything as much as you do. So in that case, that's the normal talk I always have with my patients, my friends, and my neighbors, and all the other people. Now, we have to, like, uh, as I said, Allah blessed us uh, on us this country. And as an Australian, we enjoy lots of benefit. I can't actually finish the list, but I just point out a few points. Like, we live in a relatively peaceful country. I always say relatively re peaceful country because incidents happen here also. Like, this morning, someone was shot in Logan area. And every day we get some kind of uh, uh, news there. So I cannot say absolute peace, peaceful country, but if you compare with other countries, it is relatively peaceful. And that is Allah's blessing. That is Allah, uh, we are having the benefit here. Enjoy a certain amount of freedom. Like uh, if someone say Australia is a free country, I don't agree with it. I said we, we are bound with rules and regulations. So that's why we enjoy a certain amount of freedom, which maybe in many other countries, they're not fortunate enough to enjoy that freedom. Enjoy the fruit of democracy. I lived in uh, or worked in many countries which was ruled by the dictators, which was ruled by the, uh, you know, fascist governments and a lot of other different types of governments, kingdoms, you know, but democracy is a different thing. I don't say that democracy is the ultimate thing or the best thing, but we still have a fruit of democracy because um, someone we don't like, we can vote them out in next term, you know. There's always a next term there. And a uh, lot of the things uh, I say, I have the right to say like this, you know. There is social welfare in this country. And many of the countries, there is no social welfare. There is, the government doesn't have money, but they have a system here, which if I fail, 
to earn money and I can be supported by the social uh, welfare. High standard of education. Definitely a lot of people come from overseas to have educated themselves here because our, you know, uh, standard of education is very high. High standard of health care, one of the best in the world. So that is uh, we need to be proud of. And uh, I, I am uh, definitely proud of it because I am also a part of it. Enjoy religious freedom. There is some obstacles there, but still they allow us to convert a church into a masjid. They allowed us to be gathering here. They allowed us to, like we have uh, some resistance, but ultimately we get it what we want. Uh, we enjoy religious freedom also and uh, consider to be the land of opportunity, like Australia, long time before America, these are the new lands, you know, people didn't know about it. And from that time, people used to understand that the land of opportunity, because if you work hard here, work properly, honestly, you can have your bread and butter and you can prosper. So I just listed a few things, but there may be a lot of other things to be considered. As a Muslim, we have to fulfill our duty towards Allah. So Allah give us, actually, who give us all these blessings? Who give the, us all this niyama? It's all given by Allah. So we have to be uh, always grateful to Him and realize that Allah given this, so we have to be perfect ourselves. And how we can do it? Be His servant all the time. That's, again, in the introduction I said, Feel that you are always Allah's servant. Allah is always seeing you. Nobody can see you. Don't do anything wrong because Allah sees you. And the karamin katabin on your both shoulder, they're writing your uh, deeds, all the things that you do. So if you have that feeling, always your spirit, your faith, your guides you all the time. Remember, um, remember uh, shahada always. Like, shahada is a commitment. You may say declaration. Like, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You said that. Remember that you did it. That's in your heart. That's what you believe. That's what you have to keep all the time in your mind. Like 24 hours, even you are sleeping. How? How I can remember that she's sleeping? Like, some brothers tell me he reads shahada all the time when you get... Uh, time. Nothing else to do, he read the Shahada. Then he said, uh, then I said, what happened to you after that? He said, in, I feel that I'm reading the Shahada during my sleep. You understand? So you can actually, you, sh you have to remember the Shahada, like you're going to bed, sleeping, and you're reading the Shahada, and you wake up and reading the Shahada, declaring the Shahada, it's always with you, 24 hours. That's the thing you need. And remember that you are the follower of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You cannot do anything. He's the leader. He's the guide. He came to this world to give you the way of life, and never follow anything else except him. Follow the other people who follows him only. So that's uh, the thing, uh, the, the way it uh, works. As Quran said, "Ati Allah, Ati Rasul, Walil Amri Munkum." Like. Uh, follow Allah, follow the Prophet and the people amongst you, those who lead amongst you, follow them as long as they guide you on the way of Allah and Prophet. You don't have to follow them when they are derailed, when they go away from the Allah and Prophet's way. Now, after Shahada, I'm talking much about Shahada. After Shahada, the most important thing that comes on us is establish Salah. Now, why we use establish Salah? Uh, why we not say apart from Salah? Because if you read Quran, you'll see all the places Allah never say apart from Salah. Allah said, Yaqimu Salah. Yaqimu Salah means a, a broad way. Like, you know, it starts with so many things. Some of the discussions were today that Yaqimu Salah was there. Like, Allah wants uh, uh, a, a society, a qom, a ummah, who are, who the nation is based on Salah. 
their everything, their belief, their performance. Like um, um, one of our sheikh, when I was a boy, I listened to his lecture. He said, all the masjid are a small masjid and dunya is the big masjid. So why Allah want you to come back five times in the masjid? So uh, he said that he wants you because you wake up in the morning, he wants you in the masjid because you have the training for few hours that you will be, what you will be doing in the dunya, the big masjid. So he wants you to come to the small masjid and get the training and the spirit and the power and everything, then go out and work and follow what you have committed to in front of Allah. Uh, because uh, Allah said, uh, the salat miraz mu'minin is the, um, uh, salat is the thing that uh, mu'min, they meet Allah. So you meet Allah further, then you go out so that you don't do anything wrong in between before coming. You are a human being, you can forget. So he wants you to come back in Zohar again and get the spirit and the power in, it, in the small masjid and then go out to the big masjid which is dunya up to asr it's the same way you come back uh, in maghrib same way you come back to esha because when you finished all your duties now you will go to bed so come before to allah before going to bed become a muslim purify yourself and heart uh, say all the promises that you wanted to make and then go for sleep so that's the reason Allah said establish salah, the whole things and the society. Like you say, uh, part of the established salah is establishing masjid also. Like think about Holland Park Masjid. It was established more than 110 years ago. Those people, none of them are surviving. But the masjid is there. Masjid is surviving and a lot of Muslims is coming there. Now, last year we established this masjid. And many of us will not be here after 20 years. But a lot of new people will come and stay, and this masjid will stay. So that is another meaning of the establishing. And the society that is growing around it, like uh, the Muslims has a uh, you know, uh, responsibility to do a kamat deen, establishing the deen. So this is the part of the deen, and the first step of the deen to establish salah. So, um, established, so the establishing masjid is the first part of it. A society will grow with it. Like now, if you see that Slacks Creek, around Slacks Creek, a society is growing up. In Holland Park, a society has grown there. Dara, a society has grown there. Every masjid, a society is growing there with it. And that is the beauty of it. That is the establishment of Salah. And the people who are involved with it, they have the responsibility to, to guide the society properly. Okay? And uh, the guide comes from the imam and the leaders and the people who establish the masjid and run it. And that should be the way. And that include guidance for the children's education. Children become educated in it and they become, uh, you know, part of this thing. And adult education, then terbiya, like Qiyamullail is a tarbiyah program to learn and purify ourselves and to get ready for the spiritual journey. So these are all the things that we have to do through establishing Salah. Now, this thing I have put in here, discover yourself. Yourself means as a Muslim, as an Australian Muslim, you have to find out yourself. You have to discover. Why I'm saying that? Because when I came to Australia, few things has uh, surprised me. Like, uh, within my first day or two, I met a boy. His name is Omar. He's from, his friends are from, uh, his parents are from Pakistan, but he uh, is born in Australia. So then uh, I was going to pray in uh, Friday Masjid, uh, then I asked him, Umar, where is the closest masjid from our hospital? He said, I don't know. I said, why you don't know? <laughs> you grew up here, you born here, you don't know. What happened? Oh, my parents never uh, teach me how to s perform salah. And he is a 25-year-old. And I said, uh, then I, we had some conversation and then we, uh, then uh, I helped him to learn and then to 
get uh, into the eat. Then I said, oh, there is people like Omar here. There is people like worse than Omar here. I realize it later. Like uh, I, I met a person, his name was Ali. I said, well, your name is Ali. Uh, what is it? Because my ancestors came from uh, Turkey. So my grandfather's name was Ali. So that transformed into Ali now. I said, why? Because he married a Christian woman, Australian woman. So they are lost, you see. So that's why Muslims need to be discovering. So you have to discover the Muslims. You have to go up to the society, find them. Because a lot of Muslims are there, they've lost their identity. Like, you know, so you have to work on them. Then I realized that why I am here. Why Allah, you know, in somehow forced me to come here. I didn't want to come here initially, and I didn't have any plan, but I had to come here. Then that's why I understand that, oh, that is the reason to meet Allah sent me here, that first or second day of my... Actually, I was a medical registrar, and he was my intern. So Allah sent me here to meet Omar first of all, and talk to him, and give him the guidance, and then met a lot of other people, Omar's friends, and a lot of other people, those who were lost, and... I have to help them to discover themselves. So there's a lot of people in the society, young, old, they are lost. And you need to discover them. And that will be discovering yourself. Otherwise, your staying in Australia is not at all useful. Your staying in Australia is not accepted by Allah. So that's the way you discover yourself, discover the other Muslims, those who are lost. And you will find them in the society. And they might be called, oh, I met another one from Iran. Uh, they were calling him Jim Kalantar. I said, Jim Kalantar. Okay. Then I realized uh, one of his relatives came from outside and said, uh, asked me, do you know Jamshed? I said, Jamshed? Who is Jamshed? We don't have a Jamshed in our department. Uh, he said, no, no, there is a Jamshed Kalantar. I said, Jamshed Kalantar? Is he Jamshed Kalantar? He said, yes. Oh, we know him as Jim Kalantar. Then I said to him, I went there and I met his friend, and then he left. Then I, he is a little bit senior than me. I said, brother Jamshed, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. He said, I said, how you become Jim from Jamshed? Tell me. <laughs> I never thought he's an Iranian and he's quite fair looking, like looked like almost like the Australian. So I never thought that Jim Kalantar could be Jamshed Kalantar. I can tell you hundreds of stories like this. You know, you just keep your eyes open, keep your mind open. You will find a lot of Jim, a lot of Omar, a lot of Ali, and a lot of other people, and you know, and how they transform themselves, how they hide themselves, how they lost themselves. And that's the discovery you need to do. And in that way, you have to reform them and yourself as an Australian Muslim if there is any shortcoming you are aware of. So you have to do correction of this. Including your outlook, you should look like a modest person. Like people attract to your personality first before coming and discussing about religion. Like, never hide that you are a Muhammad. Okay, most of us are Muhammad, you know. So that's the problem. Because I had a big certificate of my fellowship certificate, big in my front, uh, front door. It says, my name is Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Akram Hussain. So I don't hide it, okay. I have, um, you know, uh, captures of like... A, Ayatul Kursi and a lot of other things, Allah and Muhammad, in my uh, room. So people ask me, what is this? I said, this is this. So this is the way the talk start. So this is the way you find out people. And uh, even some people say that name doesn't look like Muslim. They can say, oh, I am also a Muslim. I said, why your name is like this? Oh, that name is not real mine. My actual name is this. So you find out like this, you know, you expose yourself, you don't hide yourself, that's the way you find out them. 
So that's one of the technique I always follow. Uh, you should respect other people and people should respect you. That's the two-way process, you know. So you have to feel respected and you do respect the others. Always remember as a servant of Allah, you are an ambassador of Islam. So that's the job you're doing here. If you cannot do it, it's, it's not a uh, spiritual life that you're maintaining. So you have to do all this. Family, then after all this about yourself and things that the family cast as the most, responsive, uh, most responsibility on you, you have to establish Islam in your family. For that, you have to be a role model, like a father or a thing. Children will have to learn from you. Remember, children will follow if anything you have done wrong. Like, uh, you have done something wrong, okay? And uh, then the children will say, oh, my father did it, so it might be right, okay? But it may not be right, okay? So you have to be careful. You have to learn best uh, pa parenting method. So parenting is a big subject. Now, I think on 10th of April, we are having a parenting uh, session with one of our uh, elder brother coming from uh, London. So uh, that so we'll uh, publish that what we are doing in that uh, particular session, and we'll be talking about more parenting. Quran and Sunnah helps you in that method as it is the best method in Islam. So you don't have to go anywhere. You have Quran, you have Hadith, you have uh, the guidance from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the way you go. And the most important part of your life is your family that you maintain. And this is for the family and yourself, that haram, halal, riba, these are the three striking things you have to be always away. And like, mashallah, most of our uh, families, we teach the um, children haram and halal, and a lot of our children, they understand it, that uh, what is halal, what is haram. Uh, so they are growing up like this. But there is something beside that, the lost families also, so you have to help them. You need to have clear understanding on these three matters. Give clear understanding to your family. Children can learn early in their life. Earliest is the best. You income should also be halal and spending is also should be halal. Our children are being targeted by extremists. So what is the message there? Uh, the, the targeted by many different ways. You have to prevent it. Teach them Breaking the law of your own country is haram. You're breaking the law here. You're acquiring a gun. This is haram. Uh, this, is, this is not only wrongdoing. I, I don't say wrongdoing. It's haram. Don't do it. And harming people and killing is also haram. So you can't do it. So tell clearly that this is the haram thing. You can't do it. Then they can, we, you can prevent them from becoming extremists. Reforming the society, this is a work we have to do. Our society, the Muslim society and the other society and everything, we have to reform. After reforming yourself and your family, you have to reform the society. You, immediate society is your Muslim community. There are many people who are lost. Again, as I repeated, we need to bring them back to the light of Islam. We have to do everything to protect our society. Have to do active dawah. Now I'm coming to dawah because without active dawah, you cannot do all this responsibility. You cannot fulfill this responsibility. Dawah starts within yourself, followed by your family, then your immediate Muslim community, and extended up to the wider Australian community or wider Australian society. If you are involved in active dawah, this will purify your own soul. That's why you need it for yourself first. Like you, you want to be a da'i and you keep your spirituality, that's help your soul purification. That's help your family and that's help the others too. You will feel stronger and help you to walk towards perfection. Like if you want to be perfect, dawa, doing, giving dawa to others, talking to other people, that makes you more perfect, toward perfect. This will take you spiritual journey towards another height.
So Dawa will, uh, your spiritual height, uh, journey of your spiritual height will be higher if you actively do Dawa. If you don't do Dawa, it will be like a stagnant water. But if you want to be river water, you do Dawa. Organized a collective life, like a lot of people doesn't understand the, uh, you know, uh, usefulness of having an organization. Now, uh, when Slackstick Masjid we established, we run for the money, we went there, we have an organization. Uh, that organization power helped to reach to the people. And now, without an organization, we cannot run it. We need to have discipline, we need to have rules and regulations. So, remember, you like I'm talking about IPDC here because IPDC's first job was to dawa, second was is to organize, third was to terbiya, which will come, and fourth is the social welfare or making some environment for the people. So, and Hazrat uh, Omar said that there is no Islam without Jama. La Islam illa bil Jamaat. So, this uh, important saying that Sahaba and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have a collective life. They stop, uh, and established halaka and units where you can, best centered in around the masjid. So now we have few um, halakas in different masjids, including Slack Creek. So um, uh, mashallah, that would be increased in future. And all you need to do, work hard. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established a jamaat, then a society. So jamaat come first, organization then a society, then a state or something like that. But we don't dream a straight in Australia, but we dream society. We have to follow his method, okay? Then comes tarbiyah, learning and training. Follow a personal development profile. We have a personal development profile. You can collect it from our brothers. And uh, that includes uh, rec keeping record of your Quran talawat, your Quran study, Hadith study, reading Islamic books, record of uh, sal uh, salah in congregation and all daily activities to improve yourself. Because if you measure it, what you're doing, and look at it, then it gets better for you. Tahajjud prayer and optional fasting, these are also the things that can make your terbiya stronger. Perform daily self-evaluation, which is self-criticism or mohsabaya nafs. So we'll discuss long uh, about it another day how it should be done. So normally it's done at the end of the day and where you have a glimpse of the day, you make uh, repentance if you have done any wrong, if you have done anything good, say Alhamdulillah and Allah help you. So this is the, in short, the self-evaluation at the end of the day and that keeps you purified. Involved in all Tarvi activities to improve yourself. So we, we run a lot of Tarvi activities. So you just involve yourself and Allah will help you uh, achieving your goal. Social welfare, you can, this, the fourth point, you can see in a different way. Like uh, some people say, okay, this is the responsibility we have to establish the environment for the deen. So establishing mostly is the environment for the deen helping the community, charity work, and other things. Like, Sheikh told a lot of charity today. And I was involved with a lot of charities in my life. Now, when I become Australian Muslim, one thing strikes me that I have to do charity in this country. I don't know how long I'm going to live, how, how long Allah given me hayat. That's up to Him. But as long I will live, I like to dream and to do something because a lot of people, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, they need help in this country. And uh, we hope we can uh, uh, help them and create some mechanism to help. Just uh, overseas, we have in, uh, responsibility to our suffering Muslim brothers and sisters there. That's fine, but we have to look at our own uh, backyard also. We should not forget about it. Um, so become involved in good activities other Australians do, like Australians do, Australia cleaning day is coming, we are joining them. They give, uh, donate bloods, they do a lot of good things, Australians do a lot of good things. So we can share them and that will improve our own environment, improve our social activities. 
Okay, so spiritual journey of an Australian Muslim involves a lot more. I don't have time or energy to tell everything to get together. I just wanted you to start thinking about it just as a beginning, not as an end today. So it is just start. We will welcome hearing from you in future, your experience, your difficulties. And I think I want to start it as a forum of things that uh, uh, we learn from you, we get benefit from you. Allah uh, forgive us if we have done anything wrong and Allah re reward us for our good deeds and uh, continually joining in his way of life. Inshallah, uh, Allah help us. Oma wa tawfiqa illa billah.